Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host of the podcast. Joining me on this week's podcast is Dr. Ken Steen Peterson. Dr. Peterson is a professor at the University of Copenhagen. Dr. Peterson, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us this week. Um, just in case anybody in the audience hasn't had the chance to meet you, why don't you give them a little introduction? Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm very happy that I, that I could participate on this podcast. So uh, yes, that's correct. I'm a professor of the University of Copenhagen. And actually, I'm a professor of, the, of porcine health management. So that means that I work with pigs, of course, and I'm a, I'm a veterinarian by training. And uh, well, I, I mainly work with uh, diarrhea and other aspects of, of pig diseases, mainly related to the, the antibiotic usage, you can say. But then I also actually have another role similar to you because um, I'm also a practicing veterinarian. I have my own company together with uh, some other veterinarians. So I do see pigs in the field. So uh, I bridge the gap between the uh, academic world and the, the practice. So that's, uh, yeah, I think that's very good, actually. So, yeah. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Ken, that's perfect for what we like to do in this podcast. Um, we're trying to share um, not just research, but also experience. Um, you know, I once heard somebody say, the cheapest lessons learned you'll ever have is somebody else's mistakes. And we all, if we've worked in the field, we have mistakes, right? Um, you're on today to talk to us a little bit about post-weaning diarrhea. And, you know, Dr. Peterson, um, you've got uh, a situation in Europe where um, you don't necessarily have all the tools in the toolbox that other people in other countries have to manage post-weaning diarrhea. You get the same challenges, but you got to be more creative in how you attack that problem. Talk to us about what you see, um, you know, in terms of field uh, application of solutions there and then research that you guys have done at the university. Yeah, thank you. That's true. We do. We do have some challenges and that's that's why we have. Well, I've done research with diarrhea now for 15 years, but in the last five years, we worked uh, mainly with post-weaning diarrhea. And uh, yes, we have been uh, reducing the antibiotic usage for, for many years now. But last year, at the, in the European Union, uh, we had to stop using a zinc oxide in, the, in high levels. And uh, we were quite afraid that that would give a lot of problems. And I can uh, now hindsight this now we have been away from the sink for, for, for more than a year. And we can see, especially here in Denmark, we have very good data. We can see that the antibiotic usage is increasing. It is increasing for nursery pigs. And it is because we see a lot more of this post weaning diarrhea. But what we, um, what, what we did research wise was to see, okay, we, we, we want to, we need to have some more knowledge about this so that we can be able to prevent this problem in, in the future. And they, I think it was a general traditional belief that post weaning diarrhea, diarrhea within the first two weeks after weaning was mainly caused by E. coli. And uh, we actually discovered that that's, that's actually not the case. Yes, E. coli, e. coli is still uh, really, really important. Uh, but we also found a lot of uh, rotavirus, for example. We found some salmonella cases. Uh, and we also found something that is probably uh, non-infectious you can say because we cannot we cannot see any of the of the classic in infections and and then the next research question would of course be okay maybe that kind of diarrhea does not need the antibiotic treatment um, that we don't know we have not tested that i would believe that that would would be the case but we will have to to do some more research uh, to look upon that and then the, another Quite important um, point that we found out is that mixed mixed infections are really really uh, uh, prevalent and very very important. So it's not like you have E. coli on one farm and you have Salmonella on another farm and Rotavirus on a third farm. You actually, in many cases, have these in combinations. So you have to be aware of this when you are first of all selecting what kind of antibiotics you're going to use, but more importantly, also what kind of preventive measures are you going to use. Vaccination is against the E. coli or changes to feed protein levels, 
hygiene, all those kind of things. You had to target different uh, microorganisms at the at the same time. So maybe this more traditional thinking about one infection is not uh, is not good enough. Yeah. Ken, any um, diagnostic tips? Because um, I think we often fall in the same trap in farms that I work with where you, just exactly like you said, first two weeks after they're weaned, if they scour, it's E. coli. You know, it's E. coli until proven otherwise. It sounds like you were able to prove otherwise in quite a few cases, rotavirus, salmonella, some E. coli. But, um, you know, diagnostically, how did you work those up and how would you advise others to go verify what are the problems so that you can apply the right solutions? Yeah, we actually, in the research projects, we have used a variety of different methods, you know, from, of course, euthanasia of animals, you know, with, with classic clinical science, where you do more, do like uh, traditional culture and so on for E. coli and, and so on. But we also now use more and more quantitative uh, PCR testing, also simply on fecal samples. So we have, we've done a lot of research on that way. We have related how, how, how is the correlation between the excretion in feces and the diseases inside the animals. Uh, and that, that that's actually a quite a good uh, correlation. So quantitative PCR testing, you can also test pool samples. We're using also what we call sock sampling. Uh, it's just another way to collect a pool, you can say. So we have some standard socks you can put in the boot and you can walk in some pens and you can make quantitative PCR on those uh, socks. Uh, it's a, a nice little neat method. Uh, some also do or fluid testing. Uh, also quantitative PCR, it's not, it's not so common, but it, it does does occur. And But now, actually ask me about this with the diagnostics. We we also work quite a lot with this with the, with the clinical uh, diagnostics in examinations, because what you have to realize is that, that we cannot use preventive medications anymore. We can use medications in water, but we have to make it on a clinical indication. And that means that the, the timing of the medication is really, really crucial. And we found out that if you are, if you are counting the, the number of pigs with, with the uh, fecal soiling of, of the pineal, uh, in, in, for example, three or four pens, and uh, then make some statistical uh, things to the, to the numbers with an Excel sheet you can you can get then then you can actually get an estimate. Uh, but we have yeah we we tried different techniques and this is not done. What did producers put in to either the diet or management strategies or vaccination program to try and mitigate that loss of zinc oxide? And you know now over a year later. Are producers using those same technologies? Did they get what they expected from that, or have they had to adjust because they still couldn't get the scour under control as well as it had been when the zinc oxide was available? Yeah. Now, to draw a little bit more on my clinical experience, I can tell you that we, we can divide the farms into three types after the zinc oxide. Those that do not have any problems, they could actually remove the zinc oxide. Life went on, kind of no problem. Then we have the middle group, they took away the zinc oxide, and then they started having more problems. On these farms, inclusion of organic acids, for example, in feed, a little bit of reduce, reduction of the, of the protein level in the feed, uh, vaccination uh, uh, for E. coli, for example, could be a choice. Uh, yeah, good, good things that are not, not new, not, not anything fancy, but those things we know that will work. That, that is okay in this one third of the farms. And then we had the last third, and those are where we had to scratch our heads because they apparently have some, maybe some more virulent bacteria, or whatever. But they they are difficult to handle. There we uh, we are spending more antibiotics because even despite changes to feed, also you can you make feed changes in terms of more fiber. You can make it more coarsely grinded, for example, uh, more barley compared to wheat. You know all these kind of things. We can still not control it on these farms. We still need to lose uh, batch medication. And that group of farm, I think, where those we need to look into also in research and to find out, hmm, what can we do for those producers to help them? Because there will still be a politically uh, focus for reduction of antibiotics. That will never go away. That will just keep push, keep push, keep pushing for reduction. Imagine being able to monitor your animals and farm climate remotely. The Healthy Climate Monitor combines camera and sensor data, and they will give you real-time insight into behavior, temperature, CO2, relative humidity, ammonia, and air pressure. 
light intensity, and particulate matter. We give you insight, and you get control. Find us at HealthyClimateMonitor.com. I really appreciate you sharing what you have seen out in the field, what you've researched at the university. It's tremendous information as we help to prepare ourselves for similar challenges, which turn into similar opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming on the podcast. To our audience, thank you very much for listening to the Swine Health Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinehealthblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on next week's episode. For Dr. Ken Steve Peterson, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks for joining us and have a great rest of your week. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H E L L O at W I S E N E T I X dot com.